I lost my Donkey Kong bongos, so it's back to programming on a keyboard for me. It's not too big of a deal, but I'm having some trouble setting it up. That being said, let's talk about keyboards. If you're watching this video right now, chances are you're at least familiar with the QWERTY layout of keyboard. It's the standard English QWERTY EO PASDIF GAJIKL ZIXL SIKOVBINUM, and it's most recognized as the international layout. Its efficiency and ergometry are of course heavily debated, but it's not like you're actually going to use Dvorak. But even within English QWERTY, there are still variations, the most widespread one being the English US. It's everything you need to type in English, your standard Latin alphabet, numbers, symbols, and shift key for additional characters. Even so, I do occasionally opt for the English Canadian keyboard, which is in every way identical to the English US, except for the feature in which it is better. The keyboard that actually differs from the English US is the English UK, which is used in the UK and Ireland. Notable changes include the inclusion of the pound and euro symbols, as well as some placement changes, because the British would prefer the at sign to be off to the side here, rather than off to the side over there. However, the QWERTY keyboard is based on the English language, its keys and positions engineered in accordance to the frequencies of English characters. Once you introduce other languages, it becomes a matter of design. Some languages take your Latin alphabet and add fun DLCs like tonal markings and extra characters. The English UK keyboard also acts as the Irish keyboard, allowing us to input all the accented vowels needed in the Irish language using a key called the Alt Graph. The Alt Graph key serves as a less impressive sequel to Shift, allowing us to input foreign characters or characters that are less commonly used. Having a separate key from the Shift key to input the accented versions of characters is useful because that way you can hold both the shift and alt graph keys to get the uppercase version of the accented characters. But this method of adding these accents, or diacritics, to characters can be exhausting, especially if a language has many of them or uses them very frequently. I don't want to have to use combo attacks to write a Google document. In some languages, like Polish, the solution is to just set the character with the diacritic as its own separate key, since in these languages, the character with the diacritic is used fairly frequently, and there aren't too many diacritics that will make the keyboard cluttered. However, this doesn't apply to languages like French or Vietnamese, which have several diacritics, some characters having over a dozen diacritics or combinations of diacritics. This issue is solved by introducing dead keys, which are basically keys that don't do anything on their own, but modify another character so that they have diacritics. In the French Azurdi, you input the diacritic keys before the character, whereas in the Vietnamese Telex, you input the diacritic keys after. Note that while Alt Graph, additional keys and dead keys are all viable options for adding special characters to your keyboard, most languages actually use a combination of the three. Localization of a keyboard is more than just taking the keys of one language and slapping them onto the board of another language. You also have to take into account the writing patterns of the language and change the positions of the keys to optimize for this. The French language in different regions uses different variations of the Azurdi layout, except for Canadian French, which uses QWERTY. Russian uses Itsuken, German uses Quartz, and the Swiss keyboard uses the German Quartz, but with French and Italian accents and English labels as a way to remain neutral. One thing to point out is that regardless of what the writing system of the language is, such as Russian or Arabic, most keyboards will still include the English Latin alphabet somewhere in the keyboard. This is because the Latin alphabet is essential for using a computer. Writing URLs, working with programming languages, playing Mario's fun with letters, it ensures that not even the Anuktitut typists are safe from JavaScript. In fact, many languages go as far as having a de facto version of the keyboard that is based off of the English US. This could either be for programmers or for users who are more familiar with the English US format, such as non-native speakers. But every layout I've covered thus far only addresses languages that are linear and have some sort of alphabet or alphabet equivalent. Good thing all languages use simple phonetic alphabets though. Could you imagine one that didn't? That would be so hard to learn.
Chinese characters are a purely logographic writing system, meaning that you can't determine the pronunciation by just looking at each character, and every single word has its own unique character, meaning that there are thousands of characters to memorize. At around the time the QWERTY keyboard was being invented for typewriters, there were three major languages that still employed the Chinese character writing system, and that was Chinese, obviously, Japanese with kanji, and Korean with hanja. Typewriters are a different ordeal from modern computer keyboards, however. They operated using a cylinder called a platen that was situated on the carriage and could move horizontally, and every time you pressed a key, it would strike a character into the paper and then move to the next position, until it got to the very end of the line, where it would ring a bell and you push it back so it can get to the new line. As for special characters, it works mostly the same. There's no alt graph key on a typewriter, so it either occupies its own key, or if it's just a regular key with a diacritic, you could use a dead key. The implementation of dead keys in typewriters is pretty intuitive. Just when you press a dead key, instead of moving the platen horizontally, it just stays in place until you press the key that the diacritic belongs to. However, returning to the point, no reasonable amount of keys or dead keys was going to fit the thousands of Chinese characters required on a typewriter. In fact, engineers at the time would even joke about Chinese typewriters because it was just so ridiculous. Nonetheless, people still persisted, and engineers of all three languages tried different approaches to create a practical Chinese character typewriter. The approach taken by the Korean language was to immediately give up. Historically, Korean may have used Chinese characters, or hanja, but Korean still had a phonetic writing system called hangul that was invented in the 1400s, and so it's much easier to implement that into the typewriter than the logographic Chinese characters. Thus, Korean just didn't bother with Chinese characters, and today hangul is the main writing system of the language anyway. This isn't to say that there weren't any difficulties, however. Korean hangul was still very different from most Western scripts, in that each character actually represented a syllable, comprised of two, three, or possibly even more letters. For example, to write a three-letter syllable, you have to first input one consonant, and then a vowel, and then a second consonant. Perhaps the simplest implementation, which was also the most well-known one, was called the three-set keyboard, in which the keyboard was partitioned into three sets, one for the initial consonant, one for the middle vowel, and one for the final consonant. In this way, when you press the initial consonant, it adv advances once, you press the vowel, it advances once, and the final consonant acts as a dead key that is displaced on the previous character so that you can type the characters in the order of the letters. This would also mean that the consonants were shown twice on the keyboard, once for the initial and once for the final. This implementation definitely had its flaws, however, because not every Korean character followed the layout of top left, top right, bottom. And even for the ones that did, the font looked very clunky and was dubbed as the clothesline font. This is because the characters kind of looked like a cloth on a clothesline, if cloths looked like Korean letters and clotheslines also looked like Korean letters. Two-letter characters could be implemented by just not using the dead key, but I can't imagine what one would have to do to implement characters with more than three letters. Further improvements to the three-set typewriter, as well as the invention of the four-set and five-set typewriter, allowed for more stylistic accuracy to Hangul and went fully into all the nuances of the writing system, although they did take longer to write with. What were we talking about again? Oh right, Chinese characters. Chinese and Japanese didn't have the same option that Korean did. Japanese does have two phonetic writing systems, hiragana and katakana, and there did exist purely katakana typewriters for telegrams. However, because of all the homonyms in Japanese, just knowing the phonetics of a sentence is often not enough to comprehend it. As for Chinese, well, Chinese without Chinese characters is just... Between Chinese and Japanese, there were many variants of the Chinese character typewriter, although what was most characteristic of all of them was the very odd methods of selecting a character. One method of selection was a large matrix holding every single character, along with a handle that can point to each character, and a key that is pressed that prints the character being pointed to. A similar version that looked less like a typewriter used a very large cylinder to hold all the characters instead, but ultimately was the same idea. Optimization was attempted in the order of the characters in the matrix or cylinder. Traditionally, when ordering Chinese characters, such as in a Chinese dictionary, the characters are grouped in terms of their radicals, which are parts of the character that are similar between many different characters. These radicals are then ordered in the number of strokes needed to draw the radical, and then within each radical group, 
the characters are also ordered in the number of strokes to draw the rest of the character. However, this method proved itself to be not very practical. It takes a long time to roll that absolute barrel of a typewriter, and it's not like the most common words are the ones that come first in the dictionary. Some rather clever folks figured out that they could drastically improve typing speeds by ordering the characters in terms of how common they are. Some even more cleverer folks figured out that if they grouped characters that were often used together, they could increase typing speeds even more, leading to the first instance of a rather janky version of word prediction for keyboards. An honorable mention would be IBM's electric Chinese typewriter, which attempted to speed things up by instead of having to move a handle or a cylinder around, it allowed you to input a four-digit number up to 5,400, in which every single number corresponded to a Chinese character. Now, instead of having to take all that time looking for your character, you just have to memorize 5,400 combinations. It was admittedly faster, though, and you can now type at a whopping speed of 45 words per minute. Because of all these complexities, Chinese and Japanese typewriters remained mostly for the professionals for most of their history. Luckily, this was all in the past, and so everyone was too busy being miserable to care. And besides, something was about to happen that was going to make typewriters obsolete anyway. When I press on a key on a physical keyboard, it closes a switch that allows current to flow to a chip that's inside of the keyboard. If the keyboard is a USB keyboard or a Bluetooth keyboard, the operating system of your computer will continuously ask the keyboard if any of the keys are being pressed. This method is called polling. If a key is pressed, the keyboard in return transmits a number as binary data to the operating system. In software, a character is often represented by its ASCII or Unicode value, which is a system that maps a number to every single possible character that you might want to use. However, this is not the number being transmitted by the keyboard. Instead, the keyboard transmits a number that is seemingly irrelevant to the character on the key, called a scan code, which instead corresponds to the position of the key on the keyboard. Since the operating system knows the layout of your keyboard, since you would have had to tell it that when you were setting it up, it can then use the scan code to map to a Unicode or ASCII value. From there, it can create a keyboard event, which it can send to whatever application is active. The application can then decide what to do with the ASCII or Unicode value in that event, such as render the corresponding image from a font. And there you go, without even thinking, the key that you press on your keyboard is now displayed on your screen. So many layers to implement this simple mechanic. Good thing people only use this triumph of technology for insightful decorum. I must admit that my explanation of the hardware bit of a keyboard is a bit simplified, and as a software developer, this is what we call something that we're not going to go into. However, the main takeaway here should be that since the keyboard is only communicating the position of the keys, and the operating system is what is handling the layout, the issue of keyboard localization has become a software issue rather than a hardware issue, with hardware only designed in accordance to how the software is implemented. This allows for much more flexibility in implementing different features of different languages. For languages that just use different characters or symbols or have various dead keys, the implementation is pretty straightforward. Just when the scan code for that key is given, map to the different key rather than the one you would see on an English keyboard. And as for dead keys, instead of adding a character, it would be modifying the existing or upcoming character. The software can also easily handle other features of languages, such as is the language written left to right or maybe right to left, like Arabic and Hebrew. For the CJK languages, or Chinese, Japanese, Korean, there are a few more steps to take before we can start typing. The Korean keyboard gets a bit of an upgrade from the 3-set to the 2-set keyboard, in which half of the keyboard is reserved for consonants and half of the keyboard is reserved for vowels. We no longer need a set for every single position in the character, because now the software can be used to determine the position of the next letter based off of the previous letters in what you're typing. How does a typewriter type a 5-letter character? Who cares? Ba, 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 ba. The reset keyboards still exist though, as some people find them to be more efficient, and you also don't have to type the letters in order when you're making a character, as the positions are defined by the sets on the keyboard. Just like in the old typewriter days, the secret to Chinese and Japanese input is...
Word prediction. Romaji is the romanization of Japanese, meaning that it uses Latin characters to represent Japanese phonetics. When inputting Japanese from a QWERTY keyboard, the romaji is converted into kana, which is hiragana or katakana, the two phonetic writing systems that Japanese uses. And from there, a word prediction is used to determine the kanji that the hiragana or katakana is expressing often giving you several options to choose from since there are so many homonyms. You can also use the Japanese International Standard if you want to type with kana directly, though typing in kana directly even on a Japanese International Standard is less common since it's not as convenient to type Latin characters and Latin characters have become commonplace in Japanese typing. In the mainland China and Singapore, the method to input Chinese characters is remarkably similar to that of Japanese romaji in which a romanization of the language pinyin is used to type in characters phonetically. There's no kana in Chinese, so it skips directly from Latin alphabets to Chinese characters, giving you once again a selection of options to choose out of all the homonyms. While Chinese does not have a phonetic writing system like Japanese does, there are other ways to phoneticize the language without using romanization, such as in Taiwan, which uses duyin or bopomofo, which is always fun to say. The system uses different symbols to represent all the possible sounds in Mandarin Chinese, and like a direct kana input, you input these sounds and they get converted to Chinese characters based off of a list of options. For traditional Chinese typists in Hong Kong, there's a bit of an issue because there's no official phonetic system for Cantonese. Instead, the most common keyboard layout is the Chong Key keyboard layout, which, rather than inputting characters phonetically, inputs the radicals of the characters to build them. Note that these radicals are similar to the ones used to order characters in a dictionary, but it's a different system entirely. In Chong Key, the radicals are all characters themselves, so you get fun keys like sun, and moon, and corpse. You may notice that all of the CJK input methods follow a similar framework comprised of two modules. The composer, which lets you write in phonetics and radicals, and the converter, which predicts characters from these phonetics and radicals. Korean doesn't have a converter stage, but you can use one anyway to convert Hangul into Hanja if you so desired. This framework is called an IME, or Input Method Editor, and its aim is to create a simple system for implementing any of these complex input methods. And that's kind of the whole idea of the localization of keyboards. It's not so much a localization as it is internationalization, or allowing one product to be easily adapted into any language. Sure, the English US is not optimal in typing every language, but with some keyboard stickers and a language pack, you could type any language you wanted with it. The keyboard had been internationalized by software. And so the keyboard that types in every language is no more than the keyboard we started with, your standard QWERTY English US keyboard. Now, while the English US can type in any language, including the CJK languages, there are still specific layouts that it cannot copy one for one due to hardware. One example of such is the Japanese International Standard, which has an extra column. However, as someone on the internet, I'm obligated to make poor financial decisions, and so, here we have the Japanese International Standard. Now, it took me a while, but I think I installed the IME correctly, so let's see how this goes.